There was no anesthesia, no oxygen, no warm blanket, not even an aspirin. This was going to be surgery in the raw. I had said, save my baby. Hi, Claudia. Thanks for joining me. I heard you had a near-death experience. Can, uh, can I hear about it? I did have a near-death experience. It was in 1984, and I bled to death, basically. Wow. I was expecting a, a baby. I was within a couple days of my due date, and I, I had had four normal pregnancies prior, so I had no worries. I was a healthy young mom, but I had a feeling that I should go to the hospital and be checked. And I hadn't been in the hospital more than, oh, seven, eight minutes. They said they would check me in and gave me a gown. And as I was changing, I just had a few drops of blood on the floor. I had never seen that in my previous pregnancies. And so I rang for the nurse and she says, oh, just continue getting dressed. You, you know, it's fine. This is normal or whatever. But after a few moments, this blood just... It was like a bucket that had just dropped, and it was all over the room. They wheeled me into an examination room. It had to be very, very quick. They rolled in a uh, uh, operation, scalpel, cart, whatnot, and he picked up a scalpel, and they were talking about me without talking to me, which I do not blame them a bit. This was serious, fast, fast. They were trying to save my life. But at the time that he held the scalpel up and the light caught it, you know, the shining object, and it was kind of like, oh boy, because there was no anesthesia, no oxygen, no warm blanket, not even an aspirin. This was going to be surgery in the raw. I had said, save my baby. And, you know, which is a mother's concern. We'll give up our own life. Just please save my baby. And they were determined to do that. So they cut me all the way down to get to the baby and to see what was going on because they couldn't get a heartbeat on her. And I was very concerned when um, it sounded like she was gone. And I didn't even know it was a girl at the time. It was 1984. And so you get that surprise when they're born. But uh, it was, you know, the scene was really awful. And when they cut me and started exposing organs is when the pain um, came in. And they were holding me down. And the only thing that I could move was my head. I was kind of writhing back and forth. My fingertips could move because there were a number of people holding arms and legs down. Because um, it hurt. It hurt a lot. And uh, it was at that time where I noticed that um, I was going blind from leading wow. out and the ceiling had popped off the room and the walls were becoming fluid and they were moving closer to me they were just kind of it, it seemed like they're almost like water I, it was really strange but i thought this is the tunnels that i've heard about in other ndes now it was still 1984 so really pretty early on in the studies of NDEs and that, but when I was 16, I lost my dad. I adored my dad, and I wanted to know where he went and what he was doing, and did he miss me, and, you know, all of those questions. I spent the next 15 years before my NDE reading as much material as I could from Dr. Raymond Moody and, and, and you know, whatever I could find out there to help me feel closer and to solidify that knowing that I was going to see him again. And so here I'm in this position and I'm dying. I'm being told I'm dying. And I didn't focus wholly on what I was leaving, going to be leaving behind, how awful for my little children and everything that they were losing their mom. I just kind of went to a happier place where it was like, I'm dying, I'm accepting this. I think it was the accepting of it that I went, oh, I'm going to be seeing my dad. So there was a, a wave of excitement, not excited to die, but, you know, just that I was, you know, it's been 15 years I hadn't seen my dad. And so as the walls were coming in and the room was darker, 
I just kind of popped out of the back of my body. I saw this lifeless child. I mean, it was looked like a war had gone on. And I had just had enough of the awfulness of the situation. Well, and I could hear the music from MASH being played. You know that? My hearing became really acute as I was losing my eyesight. And I could hear things all over the hospital. And this little bit of music was something where it was like, I think I popped out to go find the source of the music. And it wasn't even weird that I was floating. I didn't notice it that I wasn't walking. It was completely natural. I went through walls. I didn't think, oh my God, I just went through a wall. It's like riding a bike or something. Everything I could do, I was like, I've done this before. So it didn't even, that did not register that this was weird. But when I got into the man's room that where this television was playing this music, I could tell that he didn't know I was there. And it came to a point where I kind of got in front of his face, you know, from the side of his bed and, and doing this. And there was nothing. And I went, oh, my goodness, I'm dead. I'm, I, I died. And as soon as I thought that, it was like this. And I was in another place. I was in, and it's hard to describe, um, earth words are hard to describe something so wonderful, but it was perfect place of darkness, of blackness. I was being cradled and cared for and loved by this enormous vastness that had consciousness. And it knew me and it loved me. It knew me intimately. It knew me everything about me. And it just was swaddling me like a satisfied, you know, burp, fed and burped baby. You know, it was just, I, I was so happy there. It still gives me pause and, and goose pimples to this day to have been in such a perfectness that, and, and, um, I started to hear a nurse, I, I reached for this ear because it seemed like it came from this side and they were calling me back. They were calling my name and it was the most irritating sound because I was in this perfection that you didn't need to speak. It was all feeling. Um, I didn't hear anything while I was there and your audience may have questions as, did I see anybody there? Was my spirit guide or was my dad or anybody there? It, I didn't. What I was just being loved by the eternity, the vastness of the whole thing. I've been asked, did I see my body? If I had a body, I couldn't have seen, right? I, it was completely dark. But I don't think I did because I was floating in that throughout the hospital. I think it was possibly more of an etheric body um, because... When I left my body, when I popped out of the back of it, there was this freedom, this just wave of, of, you know, doneness with those earth overalls, you know? Mm -hmm. And I didn't look at them like, oh my goodness, my, my poor body, my, my Claudianess laying there helpless and gone because Claudia was fine. Claudia was great. I had everything that was me was still there. So I didn't even have a, you know, a shed a tear or anything over what, over that body I was leaving. I was, I was complete. So I had this voice kind of invading this perfectness and I was trying to think of a way to make it go away. They kept saying, Claudia, your baby is alive. You need to come back. You've got to come and take care of this little girl. And I had seen a baby, a lifeless baby. And so, it, you know, I was kind of fighting that, that they're teasing me or whatnot. And I, I didn't want to leave the perfectness where I was. And so I tried to form like an earth voice and say back to the voice, no, I'm, I'm fine. I want to stay here. You know, it was like just arguing with the voice and as I was trying to form those words I was back in my body 
Um, I wasn't conscious very long within it um, because of the pain. But, uh, I woke up later in in a hospital room. I had had many transfusions. They were still bringing in blood. I think every two hours I got a new unit of blood. They were really, they had worked two miracles that night and brought back both of us. And within a couple of days, I, uh, I woke up to a researcher in my room. I had been slated as a really good candidate for a near-death experience study because I had had no um, drugs. You know, as a pregnant woman, I wasn't even taking an aspirin or drinking caffeine. So, you know, I it, it was not a, you know, she's hallucinating, she's on drugs or, or you know, whatnot. She's in anesthesia and having a really great dream or something. So, you know, they were there asking me about the, the pain. They wanted to know if I could express what the pain felt like. My my first impression was that cutting with that sharp instrument, it stung, but it wasn't horrible. It was, I mean, it was like salt in a wound, kind of. As a little kid, I, I used to put salt in my wounds. I don't know why somebody told me that. It said, oh, that'll make them heal faster. So I equated that. Yeah. Oh, that was like that, that salt in a wound. So they went on to ask about my you know, where I had gone. Did I see anybody? Did I feel anything? Did I hear anything? And as I started to explain about this blackness, this vastness, this perfectness, but I I didn't have those words to express it at the time. I think I, you know, and, and also, you know, you, you don't feel good. You know, you're just recovering. And it's, it's right. kind of like um, I was in blackness. Um, I think is what I got out. And the look on the researcher's face when I said that was like, I think they were really excited they had a good candidate, but I wasn't giving them the great story they were after, you know, this great experience. And and though it was great to me, man, I was, you know, it it I I keep it sacred. It was amazing. But to somebody looking for more the gardens, you know, seeing my dad or my grandma or somebody and seeing Jesus or what did they say or what buildings or whatever looked like, I didn't get any of that. And I I decided that I needed to keep it mine because it felt soiled already by the expression on, on this researcher's face. And I clammed up. And I didn't talk about this um, because I didn't want anybody to put any negativity on it. You know, you were in blackness. You didn't go to the light. Didn't you see the light? You know, all of those things. And especially having read so many di different near-death experience accounts, man, I felt kind of slighted, right? <laughs> it was mm -hmm. like, I didn't get the good What What's wrong with me? It was years and years of kind of beating myself up and pushing the experience down. I continued to read other experiences and I kept asking, you know, I sure would like to know because I felt like there was more to my experience. But, and I did find out later that yes, it, it was true that much of my experience had been veiled. I don't think I was ready for it. I don't know. Um, but what, because when I went back into my body, I, I, I think I was in a loss of memory of what had happened because I kept, I'd pray, I'd, you know, ask really nicely. I was pretty fervent about it. And sometimes I'd get really pissed off and I'd be like, I want to, I'm ready. I want to know. And I noticed in one of a, a dream that there was a character in the side, my side vision and it was um, it was like making weird movements, flying, flying and darting about. It was a fairy, but it wasn't one of those beautiful fairy princesses, or you know, it was a it was a chubby, hairy guy, hairy back. I mean, the whole thing with a cigar in his mouth, and he's flitting around. And when I'm you know I'm kind of in this dream, but I I keep 
my attention keeps being pulled to this, to the corner of my dream, whatever the dream screen you're in. And as soon as I focused on him, he held up this, you know, card, billboard, whatever, and said, um, pay attention to this. He wasn't speaking to me, but he would hold up cards that I could read. And he really taught me how to become lucid in my dreams. And so that's where I get my memories of my near-death experience. I'm given things in like parables or metaphors or a story form. So they give me a story and I am recorded immediately. And those are what are in my books are, um, they're short stories of things of those dreams that where it's like, oh my goodness, this helps um, fit into the puzzle. What I love about uh, your story is that it, it wasn't what you expected. Like, I think you had to talk with Eben Alexander. You know, if you were to design an NDE, like you would have done it differently. So that kind of just shows you that it's not your imagination or that you're not making it up because it's, you know, it's completely opposite of what people think they're going to get. So Right, exactly. That was a conversation I with Eben Alexander. It wasn't directly to me. It was at a luncheon and mm -hmm. he was kind of kitty corner on the table at a, an IONS convention. And yeah, when he said, I, if I could have designed my own, well, I went, my ears just perked up because he said, I would have seen my dad, which is exactly what my expectations were as I was dying. Oh, I'm going to go see my dad. And I think, you know, when the question pops up of, you know, how come NDEs are all so different? I think what we see, what we live through and get, are able to bring back is beneficial to us and possibly um, in the sharing of the story going to be beneficial to others. But I, it's usually not the same thing if we could have created our own. I don't know. <laughs> Definitely. So I think some people see these and they go, oh, they're just trying to get famous. They're just trying to write a book. They're just trying to do that. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, you had to almost be forced into it. Absolutely. You know, when you push something down, whether it's an abuse or so, something awful that's happened in your life and you, you try not to talk about something and it starts bubbling up and you push and you try, but you get to a point where it's got to be expelled. You've got to share. And um, I had a friend that said, you know, you've got a book in you. I had, you know, 10 different journals of dreams and things that I was keeping track of, but they were personal. They were, I thought maybe, may, maybe one of my kids might read it one day, but I had no intention of putting them in a book because to me, it wasn't a, a story. It wasn't, you know, middle the plot, the beginning, middle, and end, and, and that there's my NDE. It was a continuing thing, and I and and I was told in in dream, you know, I do have a book in me, and what it, you know, to just write my stories, share your stories. I don't know any NDE book out there that's made you know all kinds of money. You know, there've been a few. Evans probably made some money on his, but he also spends a lot of money touring, and you know sharing i mean this is kind of a passionate gift to the world and yeah so i've i've written three books now and i've um, i can almost pay the editor back you know with the good results you know yeah. it just works it's not a money-making venture and <laughs> i always like to ask people this question just because uh i just really enjoy asking it so how real was it like could it have, could it have been a dream honestly i lay and go to sleep looking for the dark that darkness again it was so real and so beautiful that funny thing in the first few months in that i would put even blankets in that over my head trying to recreate that space you know because yeah when we shut our eyes at night you know there's flickers of light and things going on if you if you notice and pay attention there's nothing like that calm, quiet blackness. So I must have looked crazy, you know, under my blankets, just trying to, to recreate it. But no, it's, it's there. It, it's in front of me and it engulfs me and I chase it and want it to come back. <laughs> when you said in your NDE, the ceiling popped off, was that literal? Like, could you see the sky? I 
could see the sky. It was, I could see stars. And in fact, I, that is what drove me into a knowledge that I, that there was much more to my NDE. So if people want to contact you or what's the best way to get in contact with you? I have a website. It's ClaudiaEdge.com. And there's a place where you can send me a message and, uh, you know, all kinds of videos, books that I've liked, other people to get in touch with. There's a lot of stuff on there. All right. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so thank yeah. you so much. Was there anything that you wanted to say? I think if we looked at each other as souls, the magnificence that we are as souls, taking on this really hard ride here. You know, this is Earth is rough. It's hard here. And we take it on and we take these suits, some of them with we're disabled and, you know, learning disabilities and abuse and starvation and all the things, you know, just trying to make the rent every month is, you know, an awful feat for each one of us to accomplish every single day to get out of that bed with our hurts and everything else. We're all beautiful, magnificent souls that have taken on a role for whatever their spiritual reasoning, for their purpose, for their mission. So, you know, let's, let's not try not to be so mean to each other. <laughs> So be nice. There's my, <laughs> be nice. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So nice meeting you. Very nice meeting you too. Thank you for the invitation. Hey, thank you for watching. Uh, if you want to know what video to watch next, I would suggest this one. This seems like a really good video for you to watch right now. Yeah, that seems like a good one. Oh, you could subscribe. You could do that too. Subscribe or watch this video. Up to you. Bye-bye.